we really believe as we're moving forward and people are consuming more on social or via audio that um, it's more than just attention. We need to actually find a way to become influential. And mm-hmm. the difference between the two is really trust. You're listening to the Small Business Mastermind, a podcast created by Olympia Benefits to help small businesses juggle business, finance, health, and wellness. I'm your host, Morgan Berna, and to subscribe to the podcast, simply visit olympiabenefits.com slash podcast. Hello, and thank you so much for tuning into this episode. This is a chattier episode with a ton of great content, so I'm going to keep this introduction short so you can get right into the episode. This one is all about content marketing and how it can help you improve the relationship between your business and clients or customers. We talk about how a small business can dip their toe into content marketing, what expectations you can have in terms of lead generation and sales with this type of marketing, and tips for companies that have already started creating content but are looking to get more results. We also dive into the backstories of Mike and Mitzi Payne, our guests today, and get a look at what has worked for their clients and business. This was a very fun one for me to record. Not only are Mike and Mitzi marketers like myself, but they also have a podcast. So it's fun. We hear a lot of stories and I think you're going to enjoy this. Without further ado, I will let you go and listen and I will check in with you again at the end of the episode. On today's episode, we have two guests. We've got Mike and Mitzi Payne, who are both partners at Arcade Studios. Mitzi is a digital marketer and social media expert committed to helping brands engage with the online world. Armed with a journalism degree and a strong desire to make the internet a better space, Mitzi jumped into the world of marketing in 2010. From growth hacking for an online edtech platform to launching a website and digital marketing strategy at a luxury lifestyle magazine to managing a community of diehard indie rock fans and even covering the U.S. presidential election in Washington, D.C., Mitzi has spent her entire career staying on the pulse of social media. When she's not staring at her phone, Mitzi is spending quality time with her husband and one-year-old daughter and running away to the mountains. And today we also have Mike Payne. Mike is a growth-minded entrepreneur, marketing strategist, and gifted communicator. He's devoted his time to becoming a specialist in the marketing space because of the impact it can have economically, culturally, and even personally. From building agencies to launching co-working spaces, his career has intentionally revolved around the focuses of consumer experience and e-commerce. Mike is driven to help his peers and customers leverage technology, community, and digital platforms to accomplish their goals, grow, and get where they're trying to go. Now leading services at Arcade, he is also an active public speaker on stages including TEDx, Next Big Thing, and Startup Canada. Thank you two both so much for coming. So Mike, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got started in marketing? Yeah, well, thanks for having us. We're really excited to be here. Uh, as far as marketing goes, it goes back quite a while. Like I think even in high school, uh, me and my friends were all about making money off of our friends. So kind of a few hacky ideas back then and that got us into marketing in the first place. Uh, but I studied it at university. I uh, didn't really feel like I got that much value when I look back at it, but uh, at the time it felt really important and it kind of got me the first couple jobs in the field uh, and started things off that way. But I think the the juicy part of the story is later on after a, f- a few of those first jobs and starting to venture into a little bit of a side hustle. Yeah. One of my good friends went to university in California for d- graphic design and uh, the whole time he was away, I was just itching to like start something mm-hmm. myself mm-hmm. because I was working a lot of corporate contexts and just felt like I didn't have enough room to really have fun with it. Yeah. And uh, decisions took a long time to be made, that kind of thing. So uh, he came back from school and we were like, okay, we're starting a business. We're going to, it's going to be about branding. We're going to do visual identity for cool brands and build websites and all that fun stuff. And that was back in about 2012. And uh, it grew pretty quickly, actually. We ended up quitting our jobs a few months after that. And um, at the same time, we actually had an opportunity to go in on a space with one of our clients. So we were looking all over town for space. And uh, we found this warehouse in the warehouse district of the city that we were in. It was way too big for us. But we were like, 
we got to have this space. Yeah. So we decided literally within a week to launch a co-working space and we found a private investor and wrote a business plan within like three days and signed a 15 year lease and <laughs> just went to town. And uh, it was the craziest thing I've ever done. But at the same time, when I look back, that was a big part of what allowed our business to really grow and take off and get noticed. Yeah. And uh, it brought small businesses all into one environment with us where we could then like provide our service to them and, and see and, what um, exactly their needs were. Yeah. And help them come to life. And then around that time, uh, I met Mitzi here and uh, she was in marketing as well in a different city. She was in Vancouver and uh, we just started kind of nerding out on marketing and realizing that we had a lot of commonality and similar goals and uh, but different expertise. So we were more on the design side and uh, she'll tell you a bit more, but she was on social media and digital marketing side of things. So a big opportunity for collaboration and a natural handoff from our part of the process to her part of the process. And uh, long story short, we ended up getting married and merging our two businesses into one, uh-huh. and uh, the rest is history. But do you want to do you want to share a little bit of your side of things? Yeah. So we've also got Mitzi here. So Mitzi, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? And we have the common connection of both living in Vancouver, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that's right. It's not a lot of us out here in totally. Alberta. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess my marketing love story began after I started working. So I always wanted to pursue a career in journalism. My kind of big life goal was to be a political reporter. So I went down that route in um, university. I studied journalism and political science. Um, I interned in D.C. during the 2008 presidential election, which was really awesome and exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm Canadian, so I I went to school in the U.S. and I moved back to Canada after I graduated and then was looking for jobs and looking for work, all within the journalism media landscape. Um, I, by fluke, got an internship at a magazine, but it was on the marketing side, which I had no intention of getting into at all. I actually didn't know anything about marketing. Um, I knew how to tell a story, but um, so my plan was to start in the marketing side but weasel my way into the editorial team but once I started getting working I realized that the marketing side was much better suited to my pace and my skill set it was just like moving fast all the time and multiple projects and I was just naturally kind of that had that rhythm while the editorial side was very linear and slow and start to finish which it was just not who I am by nature. So I did really well in the marketing side and kind of grew in terms of like my role there. Um, I also was the only person on the team who really had any interest in social media. So um, they kind of just like handed it off to me at the time, which was really, really fun because I got to crash around and own a brand's marketing or social media. Um, so I learned kind of how to tell a brand story at that point and yep. then kind of just fell in love with it. And so have been pursuing and jumping around into different marketing roles ever since. Um, my last role was at a tech startup, which was really fun because I was the second employee, the only girl, um, and we grew uh, and raised money, all that. And then as it happens with some startups, we lost a bit of funding, lost a bit of runway. Yep. Um, so we kind of had to transition and pivot. So I started doing freelance on the side just to pay my bills. And then that was kind of a pivotal moment for me because I had to decide what kind of work I was going to go pursue. And my favorite part of my job was always social media, but it wasn't my only job. I usually had to manage multiple marketing projects or customer service teams or whatever. Yeah. It's often just like a small piece of an overall marketing strategy. Yep. Yeah, so at that moment, I decided I was only going to take social media freelance work and just only do social media, and which is the stuff that I loved. So I started getting a bit of momentum there and built enough of a demand um, that I ended up hiring someone and then started growing cool. my business and was doing social media marketing exclusively and then met Mike. And we did a lot of projects together and, like you said, eventually got married and merged our two businesses. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it's important to note that we didn't merge our businesses because we got married, though. It was a very much a strategic decision, mm-hmm. and uh, partly just because we were starting to see a lot of synergy and collaborating in the first place, but yeah. also we were, we were really observant of other agencies. Many of them were ahead of us, kind of in the life cycle of their business and also in the caliber of clients that they were working with, mm-hmm. and we wanted to get there faster. 
Mm-hmm. But also we felt like we could do a lot of it better mm-hmm. <laughs> between the two of our teams. But then at the same time, we were duplicating a lot of overhead costs by being two separate businesses. Yes. And uh, also just kind of creating silos where we didn't need to have silos. Mm-hmm. So I had a partner at the time, like I mentioned, and uh, we all kind of really quickly arrived at the conclusion that we should be one team. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we merged and rebranded as Arcade. We were two separate names at the time. And uh, then shortly after that, my previous partner ended up uh, exiting. So we bought him out. And then it was just the the two of us kind of leading the charge. How Mm -hmm. long ago was this? That, that was in 2018, 2018 so it's been so, two years. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of neat that you both have worked for multiple small businesses or around small businesses, and now you've got your own small business that you're, I assume a lot of your clients are on the smaller side too from what I've seen, or it looks like maybe a bit of a mix? Yeah, a lot of them are, um, especially historically. I think now that we've merged and we have just more uh, experience under our belt. We've been yeah. starting to have opportunities with more of the medium to large Very size cool. brands, but that really is just like two or three out of our suite of clients yeah. for sure. So let's talk a little bit about Arcade. What mm-hmm. are some of the services you provide there? Maybe also what are your favorite things to get to do with clients? Nice. Yeah. Um, so we kind of do three things well. <laughs> uh, we do uh, content well, so content creation, so that's in the form of photography, videography, design, um, and then we do distribution well, which is usually in the form of like social media distribution, so scheduling posts, managing accounts, mm-hmm. um, and then we also see it as distribution as influencer marketing because yeah. that's like a way to distribute content um, and then we do advertising so digital advertising in like Facebook Instagram advertising platforms mm-hmm. um, and then like Google advertising YouTube advertising all those suites did yeah. I miss anything strategy oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it, none of it really matters if you don't have a strategy so those are kind of our big three is strategy content production and distribution yeah. Yeah. And you've got such funky creative design all over your whole site. What was your guys' inspiration for that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't take a lot of credit for that. That's all like the brainchild of our design um, and our art director, Drew. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do have a content producer on our team. Her name's Jill. They're both really, really talented. They've always got really cool ideas and great taste, much better taste than we do. So <laughs> that's why they do their job really well. But we always loved like the still life kind of vibe and we love being in a studio and controlling lighting and that kind of stuff so a lot of our like content in terms of photography sits in that still life zone very cool and so you've also launched a podcast so it's Mm -hmm. called waves do you want to tell us a little bit about that and I'm curious what your I guess what your overall goal with it is Yeah, I can speak to, like, how we launched it. Um, It's actually funny. My company, before we merged, was called Wave Social, um, and they did the branding and, the like, helped me come up with the name and all that. And they did such a good job, and it got me so much great attention. And I loved it so much because it just kind of felt like me and, like, I was really proud of it. So when we merged and took on a whole new name and identity – a, a part of me was really kind of sad to lose waves, but we always kind of talked about one day we would resurface it. Um, so when we started talking about the podcast, it was just felt like a really easy match to take the brand, the waves branding and re like purpose it for the podcast. So that was really fun for me to see. Yeah. And I, as far as why we started it, um, mm-hmm. we initially actually came to the table with the idea of building a digital course. Uh, And part of the reason we were thinking of doing that was because actually there was a lot of small businesses that we were finding needed to be in the digital advertising space, Mm -hmm. whether they were in e-commerce or not, and uh, needed to just kind of utilize those channels, but couldn't really afford having an agency to manage it for them on top of ad spend. So they were kind of in this catch-22 situation of we don't understand Facebook advertising. But we need to do it. But we need to make money somehow and get people on our website. So we were thinking, okay, maybe we actually build a course version that's obviously a lot more approachable price-wise that can help them get started. Mm -hmm. And then later, once they've kind of seen that it works and scaled a little bit and just need to go to the next level, that's where we could come in. Um, And then we started working on the content and we were like, man, it would be way more fun to just like give this away for free, you know? Yeah. And also we were, we were tossing around the idea of if we're going to ask people to pay for something, we should probably 
give them value for free first and build that sort of like trust relationship. Mm -hmm. So we always had thought about doing a podcast, but then suddenly it just made sense that that would be the first step that we could start sharing really valuable content for free and uh, help brands just kind of get into it in the first place. And then later, if they wanted something like a course or to work with us directly, that could just be a a nice kind of byproduct. Yeah. I've really enjoyed some of the episodes I've been listening to lately. I love the first one about your whole love story. (laughs) So cute. (laughs) Um, And then the recent one too, about the cult branding, I thought was quite cool. And I know you went to that, that conference. It looks neat. I wanted to ask how important you think it is. Let me rephrase. So Thought leadership companies have been talking about this for quite a while. Lots of companies do blogs, make ebooks, those types of things for their lead generation. But we're seeing a bit of a shift into media content creation. How important do you think it is for a company to be starting a podcast, starting a video series, anything along those lines? I think it's very important. Uh, makes me think of a few different things, so I'll try to touch on all of them quickly. But uh, first off, I think if you're not a writer, it kind of sucks to write a blog. You know, because yeah. you have to be consistent yeah. and it has to be valuable. And often you just end up being really perfectionist about it. Yep. So it just takes forever. And there's so much out there that if mm-hmm. you can't contribute something that's going to be helpful and valuable, it mm-hmm. feels like a bit of a waste of time. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And it and brand is a slow play, yeah. you know, so it's hard to put so much time into writing these like perfectly crafted pieces about uh, your unique perspective, you know, yep. and then to not see immediate results. Yep. So that's one reason that blogging isn't as great as some of the alternatives, which one is audio like podcasting and the other is um, visual media. Um, so I think I'll let Mitzi talk more to visual media, but as far as audio goes, we, we just really believe that's going to be the way of the future. You know, mm-hmm. it's more convenient. It's easier to consume it. Uh, you don't need to be looking at a screen to kind of process the information. You can do it while you're driving or while you're at the totally. gym or whatever. Yep. And, uh, even we just did an episode with a podcast advertising expert and, uh, even just hearing about kind of the ability or the opportunity of podcast advertising is really mm-hmm. cool too. So not just producing content on the platform, but also advertising to audiences on the platform. Those are two very big opportunities. But do you want to speak to visual media? Yeah. Yeah, I think visual media is like a really cool opportunity. Not just is it necessary for brands in order to be relevant to people, um, but it's just a cool opportunity to expand your brand and let it have a life beyond you know the product that you're selling or the service yeah. that you're giving. I feel like in today's landscape, you really need to find ways to make someone's life better beyond the product, you know. And so it's it's really and media allows you to do that and really communicate that well. Mm-hmm. People are craving stories. People are craving like real moments. And so it's like a great opportunity for brands or solo entrepreneurs or whatever to insert themselves as long as they're providing value. So you definitely have to think about it. Um, And I think if you do it well, you don't have to do it well all every single day Mm -hmm. or all the time, but you need to do it well every once in a while so that you're resonating because I feel like even the really strong moments have like a longer lifespan right now that is good news for people who are afraid to enter into media at all um, you don't need to do it well every single day seven days a week you need to do it well once in a while mm-hmm. um, and then just like always look to add value yeah there's a, a quote that I had seen that I've mentioned on a couple episodes but I was seeing something that said that these days we're not just competing for consumers' attention between our brand, brand A, and brand B. We're also competing against Netflix. We're competing Mm -hmm. against, like, YouTube, people's Mm -hmm. phones, anything that's drawing attention, because when we're already so bombarded all the time, what's a way that you can pull someone in where it's attractive and it's interesting and it's not just another company throwing just another ad at them, Mm -hmm. something that they can remember, and like you said, make it enjoyable too. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I think I really want to kind of press into what Mitzi said about value and meaning, because I think that's where we brands could potentially get a leg up on something like Netflix, where people are spending so much of their time. Mm -hmm. But Netflix definitely has our attention. Mm -hmm. But and people have said, I'm sure many of the listeners have heard it said attention is currency. But we really believe as we're moving forward, and people are consuming more on social or 
via audio that um, it's more than just attention. We need to actually find a way to become influential. And mm-hmm. the difference between the two is really trust. It's not enough to just get people's attention anymore, but we actually have to build relationships with them. And if you have both at- their attention and their trust, then that's when you actually have influence over their decisions. Mm-hmm. So that's something that we really try to think a lot about, uh, whether it's producing media for our own companies or for the brands that we work with, or mm-hmm. even when we're just giving advice to people is how can you not just get their attention in the first place, but keep their attention long enough to build a relationship with them so that they trust you. Mm -hmm. You Why do you think we're seeing this shift in what consumers are wanting? Or do you think it's just that the consumers may be getting more of a voice these days with social media, something Mm -hmm. like that? I think they just have more options, Mm -hmm. you know, more options than ever, especially online. And in certain industries like beauty, for example, uh, most customers are doing their shopping on Instagram, you know, mm-hmm. so it, it's all happening right there, right in front of them. They don't have to like go through this long click journey to, to, to make a purchase. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's more convenient than ever. It's more accessible and, and there's just more options, but do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think um, with, like, social media, like, you can have a dialogue with customers. Like, you can have a dialogue with people in general. um, And brands can have dialogues with people. So that, I feel like, has enabled us to, like, become more discerning and selective of what the what kind of dialogue we want to have and we have higher standards for brands now in terms of where we're allowing them to take our attention yeah. so uh, the standards are higher there's more brands out there there's like way more things that are vying for our attention so now brands really have to think about like what what are they going to do and how are they going to enter and how are they going to earn your attention and earn your trust? So mm-hmm. it's not as daunting as it sounds. I think it's just thinking about like the humans behind, you know, who you're trying to reach. It's yeah. not just, you know, the dollars that are coming in, but think about like the people who are actually engaging with it and how are you going to leave them better or entertain them or educate them? More than ever, brands are telling narratives that aren't true because they think yes. it'll relate. But customers and consumers and audiences in general, I think, are just craving honesty Mm -hmm. and to the point that they want you to prove it as a brand. And I think that's so important to prove it. Like if you're going to make a bold claim or say that you attach yourself to a cause, like show us how you're actually attached or invested in that cause. And it's not enough to just show up and serve soup at like a, a soup kitchen one day a year with your team. You know, like what are you actually doing actively to make a difference in the cause that, mm-hmm. that attaches, you've attached to your brand statements or your mission or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It can be confusing too when you're looking at a brand and on their website and on their social media and maybe on media content, everything's sort of a different voice. Mm-hmm. And it can get a little confusing because it can feel like, oh, this isn't authentic. This is just mm-hmm. kind of pandering to me in a different way. But being able to move your values and your message across all platforms seems important. Totally. It's super important. I think people crave like to know what a brand's values are. Mm-hmm. They don't need to know everything that a brand stands for, but they want to know something so that they can align themselves with it. They want to be like, oh, yeah, I stand for that, too. And that's what makes me want to you know, purchase from them or, or use them as a service or whatever. Yeah. The other thing that I think, especially for small businesses, I think sometimes when they enter the media landscape, whether they're like creating content on, you know, video content or audio or whatever, they act bigger than they are, um, which, you know, is tempting to do. Like we're a small business and like it's tempting to do that. But um, people really want to just like, like Mike said, like they want honesty. They want to be along for the journey. So if, if you invite someone into like the journey of your business business growth I think people really get excited about that so not yeah. trying to be bigger than you are but like really showing like who's a person behind this business what are you trying to do with their business why did you start the business all that stuff is like really low-hanging fruit that maybe small businesses don't feel like they need to share but that's what people really want from small business they want to be along for the ride mm-hmm. so that like you know in two years five years ten years they're like oh I remember you know yeah and they get to see that growth feel that's like you're so part rewarding of it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I've been following a lady down in San, or uh, she's in Seattle, and she makes donuts. Nice. It's called the Flower Box. And when I went to Seattle, I really wanted to buy these donuts. And then I was 
disappointed to find out that she didn't have like a physical store yet and they were just mm-hmm. pop-ups but since then I've continued following the social media and she's like done a whole kickstarter and she's opening a mm-hmm. store and it's not going to be open for almost another year and like the hype is unreal people are just so excited they're always like posting yeah. she's giving out the rewards you get with kickstarters for cool. funding and stuff but that's it's not even started yet and she already has so many people buying into that's it awesome. just because she's showing the whole process Mm -hmm. and it's cool people don't get to see that totally yeah and some people like you kind of underestimate some of your customers by like how smart and savvy they are and what their other interests beyond just like I don't know buying whatever they need to buy Mm -hmm. because like I think consumers like they're used to a lot of content but like they're craving like real stories and they're like even the human stuff that sometimes I think small businesses kind of like separate yeah. uh, from their business. Anytime you can add emotion, I think is a win. So mm-hmm, Definitely. Do you think some people might argue that it's a demographic thing? The younger demographics maybe care a bit more about this. What do you think about that? Um, I don't think it's a demographic thing. I think anytime you can be relatable, I think that it kind of like hits home for anyone no matter where they're at like sure millennials are the main you know market on social media and especially platforms like instagram but i don't think that that story or narrative is lost in people of another generation so exactly. it hits home for everyone mm-hmm. yeah and i think for generations older than millennials and gen z they still might be consuming the information or the media a little bit differently, but they're on the same platforms. And even more than that, they care about trust and and like recommendations from a friend. And that's Mm -hmm. how they did business before social media. You know, it was really like Larry from down the street told me about this great paver, you know, so now they're doing my driveway. Um, So now that's all happening on social media. Um, So it may be a new environment for them, but I think they're on it because they want to be connected and they Mm -hmm. see that it's saving them a lot of time. Um, And whether it's finding an insurance provider or like a facial cleanser, like it's all kind of happening in the same realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's hard to not seem transparent when you're quite literally having conversations online about your brand, doing videos, things like that. Mm -hmm. It can be like you said, easy to put it on your site or make yourself seem like something you're not, but that's a little bit harder to do with media content. Yeah, for sure. And I think Mitzi kind of touched on it, but this whole idea of dialogue is really important when Mm -hmm. it comes to telling stories. Um, One thing I think, especially for some reason, B2B brands are struggling with is telling stories that invite conversation. Mm -hmm. Because when we think of telling stories, I think, at least for me, I think of my grandpa Um, when I was growing up and he would just always tell us great stories and he would talk and we would listen. But that's not the type of story that relates to people anymore, at least not in this context, but Mm -hmm. where I think sometimes we're tempted to treat it as a monologue. Really what our consumers and our audiences want is an opportunity to also like be involved. Mm -hmm. So if we can find ways in the, in the way that we're sharing the media that we're producing or even just telling people what we're up to or what our, unique perspective is or what our product is, if we can invite them into the conversation, um, then that just becomes that much more valuable. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's as simple as just asking a question. Yeah. Other times it might be gathering feedback about what, what they want that we're not offering, or it could even just be giving them an o- opportunity to speak to the audience like on our platform. You know, mm-hmm. it, There's lots of different ways to do that. But Are there any particular ways you've done that with your own businesses that have really resonated with your audience? I think the podcast is the easiest, lowest hanging fruit example. Mm-hmm. Um, for in one sense, every episode is much like this an interview. So it's not just us telling everyone what we think they want to hear, yep. but we're curating guests based on the topics that people are interested in and the expertise that they have so that we can kind of extract that for them. But then even more fun than that is also u- leveraging social platforms um, to collect information from our listeners who are really bought in on what el- what other topics they want or what benefited them. And we're seeing that too, just even in reviews, you know, like people when, when they are impacted or find value, they want to talk about it. Um, so we've, even just in the first couple seasons of our podcast, we've had so much feedback and that that's how you can tell that people are bought in because yeah. it's a, it's a dialogue, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I can add something to that, too. We had a client um, that's in the B2B space. They're, like, a lash supplier for lash techs. Okay. So 
you know, on, on social media, they have the oppor- they're pretty much entrepreneurs speaking to entrepreneurs. Most hashtags kind of work for themselves. So instead of just talking about product, we started talking about like, you know, challenges that entrepreneurs have. And we didn't really have any high expectations for it, but we just kind of talked about like how to fire a client. And then we got so many stories from people who are like, oh my goodness, I needed to know about this or needed some tips on this. Or here is my story of what I've done and what I've learned. So you kind of like create a bit of like a, it's almost an ecosystem of like giving back too. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's nothing related to like the actual product that they're trying to sell, but it is touching on some pain points that maybe their customers have or how to like actually add constructive dialogue to some of these things that all of their customers are going through. Yeah. Um, So that was a way to like, like have not just a piece of content go out there and live, but it really like invited more conversations and it actually became like a longer series, which was really awesome yeah. for them. It sounds like something people just weren't talking about, but they're probably all going through that. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. I'd heard an episode you guys just posted about inclusivity in media, that type of thing. How can people make sure that they're keeping this top of mind? So both inclusivity and maybe accessibility because if we're shifting toward media content, that creates different challenges for people as well. Is that something that stays on your mind while you're creating content? How do you navigate that? Totally, yeah. Inclusivity is really important to us. Um, Part of the reason why is because, like, I'm a minority, so I notice things, and I think that's, like, the number one advice I can offer is get people on your team or in your corner who are represent different backgrounds and different Mm -hmm. you know um orientations and all of that so that you have people who can speak to that and also who notice things I think sometimes when you just surround yourself with the same type of people you're gonna miss some things um and that's just the way human nature works so Mm -hmm. number one just like make sure that you have people on your team who represent different people and I think those people will help and let them like have a seat at the table when it comes to creating content because they're going to see things Mm -hmm. that maybe you might miss I think all of us could you know be better with having more voices involved you know for us because we 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 feel a sense of responsibility because we're telling a brand story Mm -hmm. um so to making sure that we're not alienating anyone so that's part of the reason why it's top of mind for us too, because we yep. want to make sure that when someone sees, you know, like a piece of content from a brand that they can see themselves being a part of that brand story yeah. too. We don't want to exclude anyone. So I think for us, is we're just making sure that we have the right people mm-hmm. uh, on the team who can speak to that. Yeah. And I think it's a, uh, it's just really impactful. And on the, the converse of that is it's a huge missed opportunity mm-hmm. if you're not speaking to more than one type of person. Because no matter how Absolutely. much you lean on the benefits, the key benefits of a product, um, if if it doesn't look like it's for that person mm-hmm. or the, the specific person that's like viewing it, yeah. um, then they just won't relate. Like I actually, I saw a really impactful photo the other day. I think it was actually from Old Navy or something like that, but it was Mm -hmm. a little kid in a wheelchair Mm -hmm. and he was in Old Navy and there was an advertisement of a kid in a wheelchair wearing their products and he was just so hyped because it was like the first time, Mm -hmm. I think it was the mom sharing it or something Mm -hmm. and she was just saying it was the first time he had ever seen any advertisement with someone who looked like him. Mm -hmm. So it's not even just like um, ethnic minorities or specifically ethnicity it's all different types of people like Mitzi Mm -hmm. said orientation or even Mm -hmm. circumstance you know Mm -hmm. like being in a wheelchair um, or visually impaired Mm -hmm. and that comes down to accessibility as well but um, if people don't see themselves using that product even in your advertisements or the media that you're Mm -hmm. producing then as much as it could solve their problem it won't be relevant Mm -hmm. to them so Mm -hmm. We also just did an interview, actually, that we just dropped um, on the podcast about building accessible websites, because I think a lot of people don't think about that, maybe, uh, when they're building their website. So just a few really simple things is, like, making sure that, you know, any images that you're producing has, like, a a decent contrast ratio Mm -hmm. for people who might have visual impairments, and then also making sure, like, keywords are attached to your images. Mm -hmm. Um, So just, like, there are some really simple, small, minor things that people can keep, you know, there's even, like, checklists that exist on the internet that you can, like, literally check off as you you create content or build a website, so... 
and keeping your audience in mind. I know I worked for a company once where we redid the site and all the text ended up being a sort of lightish gray color. And we immediately had people writing in to us being like, we can't read this. It's too small. Yeah. It's too light. What are you doing? Totally. Maybe it looks nice, mm-hmm. but it's not. We can't read it. So very simple fix to just make it darker and like up the font size one or two. Yeah. But I think that's when I noticed too people go a lot sometimes for the aesthetic, forgetting about who mm-hmm. their audience is and what their needs are. Mm-hmm. For a brand that might be interested in trying out bringing in some media content, but it's not something they've ever done before. Maybe they have a very basic website. What are some tips for incorporating this and making it still feel true to their brand? What's a way that they could incorporate this that fits for them? Because I think a lot of people get overwhelmed seeing like very flashy media content and thinking, oh, well, that's not us. Like Mm -hmm. that doesn't fit. The first piece of advice I would give if you're just starting out is to just pick one thing to be good at first and then build off of that. I think lots of brands defeat themselves before they even start because they feel like they have to be on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram Mm -hmm. and LinkedIn Mm -hmm. And also maybe running a podcast or a blog, yeah. you know, all of the TikTok, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> and then they just get super stressed out figuring out how to relate to Gen Z on TikTok. Um, but I would say pick one thing and pick it based more so on your audience and where mm-hmm. they are, where they're more, most active. And uh, just focus on being consistent with that. It doesn't even have to be like every day posting yeah. on Instagram. But even if you're like setting an achievable goal of three posts a week, you know, yeah. stick to it, show up for it and just create an expectation that your audience can have that you will fulfill. And then just focus on being honest. I think, Mm -hmm. like we've been already talking about, if you can't produce really flashy, incredible content, then just make sure it's true, you know? And I think even more so, like, the feed on Instagram doesn't matter as much as it did before. It doesn't have to be so curated. People just want to see stuff that they can relate to. And that makes it feel like they have a a deeper connection or greater access to you and what you're doing and the service that you're providing. Mm -hmm. And looking at your message is very important because you can make such beautiful graphics, but then put a quote on there that just doesn't apply to anyone or doesn't really mean anything. Or you could just write like a text thing or put up a quick 30 second video of you talking about something that might mean way more to someone. Totally. I think when you're creating content, you should just try to create content that, yeah, is honest for sure. Um, But is also either inspiring, educating, or entertaining. So Mm -hmm. if you can hit on one of those three things, then you should keep making content that fits that. If you're just throwing stuff up there that kind of just points to your website or an about page, that's mm-hmm. not really adding value to anyone's experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, trying to keep that in mind, whether you're making content for social media or for like YouTube or whatever, if you're um, educating, inspiring, or entertaining, then I think that's a good strategy. And then the other thing I think with production value, it doesn't, I don't think people want a super high production mm-hmm. from a small business anymore. Like yeah. they're really, um, even just you know, videos filmed on your phone. Like iPhone has great quality these days. Even just filming on your phone, doing a quick edit, like nothing crazy. As long as you're consistent and putting it out there and it's either inspiring or educating or entertaining, Mm -hmm. I think that's great content and that's a great start. So think about like low-hanging fruit in terms of where your your customers are in terms of picking your platform, making sure you're doing one of those three things, um, and then just be consistent. And then mm-hmm. with especially social media, you'll be adapting as you go, um, but seeing what people resonate with, where you're getting the most comments, invite people to engage yeah. with it or give them your feedback. Um, so don't just put content out there and then just like wait. Try to make sure you have some sort of call to action for people to engage and kind of give you some feedback. Mm-hmm. That's what I wanted to jump into next was along the lines of the call to action lead generation. So Mm -hmm. for, again, maybe a business just looking to start this or a business that's been doing a bit of media content, but they haven't really tied it into their overall marketing strategy. Could you walk us through just a little bit of how you go from, you know, putting up that podcast into getting sales? I think honestly, when people come to us asking like, how do I generate leads with this? Usually we tell them to rewind a little bit Mm -hmm. um, and focus. Obviously at the end of the day, you got to get customers and you got to generate sales, but um, really social and media end up being more of a long play. That's Mm -hmm. not to say you can't get customers right away, but I think the most important thing is just that if they want to get a hold of you, they can. 
There's yeah. so many brands that are, end up on social, but then there's not a clear way to contact them. Yeah. So even if you like their content and you relate to them and you want to buy their product, you kind of have to go on your own journey just to figure out how. So um, we find it's really important to just focus more on on exposure and trust, like discoverability and establishing trust and building that relationship. Mm -hmm. And then out of relationship always comes leads and opportunities. So we haven't worked really hard to create this perfect funnel, even with our podcast. It is definitely a thought leadership play and we expect it to generate leads and it has, um, but it is very conversational. Mm -hmm. And then I think we just, we treat paid media more as like the, the place for actual conversions and leads. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that? Am I going in the wrong direction? No, I think that's okay. good. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say too, like there are even podcasts out there who don't have, that don't have a clear way to like connect with. Like they don't have their, their email on their website or they don't even include their social handle in their like intro or outro, like stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's just really easy like things to maybe just do an audit on yeah. um, first to make sure that if the people want to get in contact with you, like Mike said, that they can. Um, and yeah, and I think once you build trust, like going back to kind of like our first, like our, the beginning of our conversation about influence and trust, I think once you build trust, like the leads kind of just like form from relationships. Mm So um, inviting people to like, you know, respond to some of the content or asking people for what they're, you know, wanting next from you or Mm -hmm. they have follow-up questions on your video, like that kind of thing. If you do get them on an email list, making sure that you're giving value more than asking. Like give more than what you're asking for, I think is really important. Yeah, and I think obviously the listeners are probably looking for a really practical takeaway of how can I actually just get a list of leads each month from being online, you know? And that is possible. And I think a lot of agencies or companies or SEM experts will promise that. But really, if they're delivering uh, or promising a certain amount of leads each month, they're going to be pretty poor quality. That's Mm -hmm. just the truth of the situation. Um, So I think it's not wrong to do lead gen campaigns, which can be done on a platform like Facebook. And it's really cool actually, because you just create a form within the platform. So they never even have to leave the platform to, to capture the lead. Um, but you shouldn't be doing that if you're not doing a, B and C first, which Mm -hmm. is being organically involved in Mm -hmm. the conversation, providing value for free, like Mitzi was saying, and just giving them a reason to trust you. If you're doing all of those things, then absolutely run some lead gen campaigns. And Mm -hmm. we've seen some great results there, Um, but it doesn't matter otherwise. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you two have seen what MailChimp has been up to Mm -hmm. with their studios. I've been like keeping an eye on their social media. I think they do a really good job. They've started essentially their own mini Netflix. Have you seen this? No. It's crazy, so it's called MailChimp Studios. And they don't really heavily advertise it anywhere. It was sort of just imported into the platform and you can go check it out whether you're a member or not. But I was listening to a podcast that the I think the director of marketing did and he said almost immediately once they did that, their renewal rates went up. People were like their retention rates went up. People were staying with the product just because they'd added some value to it mm. as well. So I think it can be like you said, it's a little bit of a longer play and you're maybe not getting a direct lead, but it can also help you keep your customers, keep people around. Yeah, that's such a good point. I think that's another maybe add add to A, B, and C a D as well mm-hmm. before lead gen campaigns, and that is um, how good at you how good are you at retaining your customers? You know, Mm -hmm. how many of them are going to be return customers? Because if they all just end up being one-offs, then it's not worth the cost, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Because we all know that return customers are way cheaper than than, uh, new acquisition. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I would just say don't focus on new acquisition until you know that you're able to keep them, that your system is strong enough. Don't be so concerned about just what can you plug your CRM into, but more so... What is the experience of the customer after they opt in? Mm-hmm. Um, and will they stay? And will they tell their friends about it? Because that's always going to be much more powerful than any paid lead gen campaign. Mm-hmm. Much more valuable for your company, too, to keep people. I'm curious where you think the future of media with companies is going. Do you think that you know we're, we're, we're at a point where everyone's going to start getting a podcast? Everyone's going to start doing video? Are we going to go beyond that? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Like, I think audio, there's just so much untapped potential there. And Mm -hmm. we've been, like, following, you know, articles about, you know, 
podcast networks being acquired and um, all this stuff. So it seems like there's going to be definitely more activity around podcasts and audio in general, even advertising. Like we, like Mike mentioned, we did Mm -hmm. an episode recently and it's just so untapped, like the podcast advertising space. You hear the same five ads from like every company. Totally. You're like, why is it only these five companies? (laughs) Yeah. And like, I think it's, it's such a great, um, space because you can, you're active in terms of listening, like you're taking it all in, but you don't have, it doesn't consume all of your Mm -hmm. activity. So, so it's really like an interesting space because I think it is just like the most, the least disruptive type of media for your life. It kind of just integrates into whatever you're doing, which is a beautiful thing. Um, And then of course, like everyone's attention span is getting shorter. So things like TikTok are like getting a lot of attention Mm -hmm. right now, which I think is also a really exciting space. Um, I think no matter what form media takes, I think people will still want to either be inspired, entertained, or educated. So Mm -hmm. wherever that's going to go, whether it's in the form of audio or TikTok or short short videos or whatever, um, I think they're still going to have that desire. And I think we're just trending even more and more honest, like more and more authentic. Like the more like real you can be, the better. Like people are just like getting so transparent now on social media (laughs) because like people are craving that. Yeah. (laughs) And maybe there's obviously so you set some boundaries around that, like, but, um, but yeah, I think, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a really great thing. And I think, you know, influencers have started doing that and soon to follow will be brands. Yeah. So, well, you made the comment earlier of not acting like your audience or your customers only have one area of interest Mm -hmm. and that can be a bit of a box people can get into. I think a really easy way for small businesses to do that actually is to partner with other brands. Um, I think that's such a smart thing for two small businesses to do to like go in who are maybe offering different products or services and Mm -hmm. but they kind of have some overlap in terms of customer. Um, So like trying to find someone that's like-minded who has like a similar approach to their marketing and Mm -hmm. partnering with them to create content, I think would be a really smart thing to do, especially if you're dealing with smaller budgets or smaller production, uh, because in that way, you're kind of tapping into two audience instead of one. You're also showing like some brand alignment, and then you could discover something about your potential customers that you didn't know like yeah. about their lifestyle or about their interests outside of what you're the sole thing you're offering yeah. so kind of trying to think about uh, outside of the box I think would be really cool and seeing if you can find partners in that yeah yeah and I think beyond uh audio and video and brand partnerships with which was a great example but uh I think also experiential opportunities mm-hmm. is going to be really a big part of the future of media or just advertising and marketing in general and uh, we're starting to see more and more brands do a really great job of this, um, but there's definitely room for more. And I think customers and audiences just respond really well to it. I think often because we're in such a digital world, we expect that we kind of have to start with digital and that will affect the real life. Yeah. Um, but I think there's still definitely huge opportunities to start with IRL or in real life and have that springboard then into digital and then it's much more like your audience or the people that engage with that activation doing the heavy lifting about getting that message onto digital because you've just created an environment for them to enjoy Mm -hmm. um so i'm just i'm trying to think of a tangible example but like i know google pixel has done a lot of this like they they did an activation where they um, created an art gallery space out of photos that were taken on the pixel um, oh, from different cool. photographers, but then it was also a co-working space for like a month. Okay. So people could just set up and work in it. Yeah. And then in the evenings they were doing events and other types mm-hmm. of things with mm-hmm. other brand partners. So it's just, I guess, a simple example, but even for like a restaurant, you know, maybe they they just don't have time to take beautiful photos of all their menu items, but they have a great space and they already have staff for that space to welcome people in. Yep. So maybe it's about just creating a different environment for one night of the week or yeah. having more of an intimate experience where it's like four courses and then this delicious dessert or something, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and I think, like, even to that note, like, on a smaller scale, like, even just mailing stuff to people gets them really excited. Like, we we mail our... Are you advocating for direct mail? (laughs) Direct mail has made a comeback. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of. Like, I'm thinking more so, like, find a way to 
to really make an impression in outside of the digital space. I think we were like, oh, this is going to be a piece of content that everyone's going to want to share. And we rely on that. And we're mm-hmm. like waiting for that and refreshing everything to see that happen. And sometimes it doesn't. And that's not like, it's okay. Thinking about outside of digital, how can you like make someone's day yeah. in the form of like just a little letter or like a package or a thank you package yeah. or like an invitation package. And then that actually has ripple effects that go into digital because they're likely going to take a photo of it. Yep. They're likely going to tag you. And then it's user generated content that yeah. you can share, you know, from someone else that isn't a brand. So I think that is also kind of maybe an untapped opportunity. We actually started doing that for our podcast. We send our guests these little podcast packs, which Uh include like a a mic and then like some goodies and some swag. Um, And we've been surprised to see like that they, you know, obviously it makes their day. That's something that they don't really get from other podcasts that they're invited to be on. And it's all the best stuff that they get to keep. And like they usually share it on social media. And it's a great way to tease an episode because they're like, I'm going to be on this podcast and look at what they sent me, you know? So, um, yeah, I don't know. I was just thinking, like, there's other ways you can make a tangible, like, send something tangible Mm -hmm. or create a tangible experience that kind of has ripple effects on digital. I had a company reach out to me on Instagram once to send me essentially, like, a couple free pizzas. Nice. But instead of just sending me a code that I easily could have just put a code in online and, like, bought it, they mailed me a little package with a personalized little thank you note and, like, a little pin or something. And, of course, I posted a picture. Yeah. Yeah. They found me just through location hashtags to see who was in the area of their new store. And then they were just sending people little gift bags. But, like you said, they could have just done it online. They could have sent me an email. But sending me the cute little physical package was nice because it wasn't some advertisement well like right. indirectly it was but totally <laughs> it wasn't just like another flyer in the mail it was something personalized yeah. and cute I think if a pizza company sent me anything I'd be <laughs> sharing it all over <laughs> my last question for you too if you had any favorite campaigns that come to mind that you've seen recently so I think mine is probably what I saw at that MailChimp one where they've got all kinds of there's podcasts, but they also have done documentaries. They're like partnering with Vice and then they're doing little short series and it's kind of an interesting take for an email provider, mm-hmm. marketing provider. Yeah, um, I have a few. There's a, uh, on the big brand side, uh, Sephora is partnering with, I think it was Girl Boss Radio to do Lip Stories, which is like yeah. a podcast series about the makeup industry or like insiders in like makeup and beauty, yes. which I think was like a really smart play for them to just tap in even more in that mm-hmm. space. Um, we're also like another one that I think does such a good job at content is later, which is this scheduling software for Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, they're actually B2B, uh, which is interesting, but they do such a good job on Instagram and they're really good at being like the forefront of educating people on Instagram marketing. So yeah. they have an incredible blog. It's super timely and they're really active and they kind of like tap into the right kind of like educators to help them share that story. So I think they're a great example of giving value and yes. for free, like they give so much stuff for free. Um, and and in return, they're like, I think, the top Instagram scheduler in the world. So That's awesome. it's really cool to see that. The one that comes to mind for me is another big brand, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessarily the posture that they took is not out of reach for small business. And uh, it's Spotify. Yeah. And I just think that they've done such a good job of instead of trying to just talk about themselves all the time, be like, talking about ourselves is boring. We want to talk about our, our customers or our listeners. Yeah. And they have such a wealth of data, obviously, from listeners and what they're interested in, what artists they like, mm-hmm. um, when they're listening to it or where they're listening to it. So they really started just tapping into that data for their advertising. Yeah. Um, whether it was, like, seasonal. They did a holiday campaign that was call, kind of calling out um, holiday playlists that people had made that were kind of funny mm. and just kind of literally slapping the playlist on a billboard and speaking to the person like, That's hey, so Joe, funny. like <laughs> we found it. <laughs> we know you're a, a Justin Bieber fan, but didn't think you'd listen to Drummer Boy for, you know, 46 hours over the Christmas season, something like that. Or they'd even get location specific and they'd say like, they'd put some ads up in Brooklyn to the people that live in Brooklyn saying like, wow, we didn't realize that you love ocean sound so much, but you spent this (laughs) amount of minutes listening to them, you know, that kind of thing. 
And that just makes it so much more relevant, whether mm-hmm. you see your face all of a sudden on a billboard or your name or the playlist that you created, yeah. or even seeing that other people in your neighborhood are interested in the music that you're interested in. Mm-hmm. It just makes it that much more relatable. And then you don't just get kind of bombarded with brand messages all the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. It's like a community that you're a part of. Yeah. That was a good point though, not making it necessarily about your brand, but making it about your audience and your customers as well and helping them build connections among themselves by seeing, mm-hmm. oh, we we have things in common because mm-hmm. people really crave connection. Totally. One, one that I can't like stop talking about is the Burger King campaign that they just did. It's yes. like the moldy burger, uh-huh. which I think is so disgusting to look at, mm-hmm. but such a smart way to get people talking. Um, mm-hmm. And I just like, I love that they took the approach of like, really grossing people out, which is something I think like most fast food companies try not to do. But I just like, I just love that thought process of like going so far in one direction and then getting people to talk about it. Marketers can't stop talking about it. People can't stop talking about it. I Mm -hmm. think it's just such a smart play. Yeah, I've seen articles about that one all Mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. And an interesting response to, to, like you said, other fast food places that are trying to look so perfect and so pristine. It's like one of those things that you don't want to look at, but you can't look away. And you're like, oh, (laughs) this is so gross that people eat this, which, like, I do all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Was there anything you guys wanted to cover that we haven't touched on or anything that's come to mind? One, I guess, final word of encouragement would be for small businesses not to be afraid to get into the media game Mm -hmm. and just adapt as you go. Um, I think you never know what's going to work until you know what doesn't work. So not being afraid to just try it and find like low cost ways to experiment and see what resonates and then adjust from there. I don't think There's very few brands that hit a home run the first time, so it's going to take some iteration and some trial and testing. So um, to not be afraid, just try it. Ask a few people for some, you know, what are the platforms that they're using and what, you know, try to look for some inspiration and then just adapt it in a way that makes sense for you and and just try. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add to that is just um, stay in your lane. Uh, And what I mean by that is, I think brands start somewhere and then they end up just kind of chasing a bunch of shiny objects and maybe they hear about a new platform or they see a campaign go viral somewhere mm-hmm. else or or they feel like it's too slow where they are. But really what, what wins the day is consistency. And, and then I think on top of not chasing shiny objects is also just not worrying too much about what your competitors are doing. Yeah. Um, obviously, you need to be aware of what's happening in the marketplace, But I think what you need to focus on as a brand more than anything is just how can you kind of create this romantic relationship with your customer uniquely Mm -hmm. and um, innovating on what you're doing right now is much better than just like responding or reacting to what other brands in the same space are doing, you know? So it sounds like common sense, but I think it's something that I, we constantly see brands that we come in to help or try to turn things around that that's just kind of what they've been doing. They've just been Mm -hmm. chasing their tails or kind of running around in circles. Yeah. And we're all so unique, especially in the small business space. People are doing such different things. Mm -hmm. I knew this music blog that started also covering wrestling coverage. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's a bold move, but it ended up really working out. And now they do interviews of both musicians and wrestlers, which you just wouldn't expect, but it makes the person who owns that site so much more of a person. Mm -hmm. And they're so much more interesting to follow on social media Mm -hmm. and just keep up with and go to the site because it is it's no longer just one dimensional. You're seeing multiple things. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is like a pretty big leap. Yeah. (laughs) And that worked in this case. But yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you both so much for coming on here today. (laughs) Yeah, it's our pleasure. This was fun. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And where can people find you if they're looking to learn more about Arcade or listen to Waves? Great question. Um, As far as the Arcade side, our website is arcadearcade.ca. And uh, I'd say on social, the best place to find us would be Instagram at Hello Arcade. Uh, we're pretty active on there. We'll respond to your messages if you send us one. Uh, and then on the Wave side, as far as streaming, we're on every platform. Our biggest focus is definitely Apple and Spotify, but we'll, wherever you listen, you can find us. And then we're at Wave Social on Instagram and wavesocialpodcast.com. Awesome. And you have such cool content. Everyone should go check it out and just Thank see you. all your Thank very you so cool much. creative direction. 
Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Small Business Mastermind. If you haven't already, you can join our notification list to be updated when new episodes go live by visiting olympiabenefits.com slash podcast. And if you haven't heard, we're moving to posting two episodes per month, and I am so excited to share all the great content we have on the way with you. But for today, this is all we've got for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will be chatting with you again very soon. Bye.